Sue, who are you? Uh, evening, my name's Sue O'Brien. I um, run a business which is a headhunting business called Ridgeway Partners. I'm also a member of the Women's Business Council and I am dyslexic. <laughs> which I don't, think, I don't think you knew. I didn't. <laughs> I'm here really because I ran GCHQ, the government's intelligence and cyber agency, uh, until last year. And uh, well, we could talk more about the importance of dyslexia in that organisation. I think I have to start with GCHQ. Uh, you know, and, and I don't mean to get into trouble by asking this question, or um, that was meant to get a laugh. Uh, <laughs> it, it's a, a, a body and an, an institution that's very important to the country, and it's very involved and deeply involved in security. Um, were you aware of the need for different types of thinkers? And if so, how did you, how did you do it? Uh, yeah, I've been in, in and out of GCHQ for about 15 years before I was director. Um, and I was always amazed by the work they were doing. I give them incredibly difficult problems to solve, you know, seemingly impossible uh, encryption codes to break, uh, people to find, patterns to, to discover. Uh, and it, persistently, I was sitting in meetings with an extraordinary range of different ways of thinking. And when I arrived in the organization sort of to direct it, it was just clear to me from a couple of brilliant people who were supporting, uh, particularly our dyslexic staff, that we thought informally up to a quarter of our staff were wow. neurodiverse in some way. So either on the autistic spectrum, or dyslexic, dyspraxic, uh, you know, the whole range. Um, and it was absolutely crucial to the success of the organization. It's a technology-based organization trying to do the impossible things and trying to guess the future in technology and uh, the value of dyslexics uh, and other neurodiverse groups was absolutely uh, critical to the mission. Can I, Steve, well, and Sue, really, um, we're living in a period of extraordinary change, you know, technological, industrial revolution, the impact of AI, everything. That ability to look at a problem from a different vantage point, to look at things, you know, uh, very differently, as Robert has highlighted, is that what, why EY did the report and how did it come ab about? Because you do need people that, that are looking at things in a different way. Sure, well, there's a, a lovely story, I think, behind the report. There's lots of things in an organization like EY that are top down, a leader decides to do something and it happens. Uh, this really wasn't the case with this report and this contribution. Uh, for those of you that have got it in your goodie bags, if you turn to the back page, there's uh, three people that are worth shouting out. Uh, Richard Addison, Claire Spores, and Ben Cook, yeah. all of which are here today. <laughs> and Richard, Ben, and Claire took it upon themselves with our commitment as a firm, our purpose is building a better working world, uh, put it upon themselves to create a report where we talk about the values, the strengths that dyslexic individuals bring to an organization like EY. And we estimate, Rich and team estimate, that out of our 15,000 people, about 10% of the UI team have a form of dyslexia. Now, why is that important to me? Well, out of my 15,000 people, I've got lots that can do processes, step by step, lots that can write very long, maybe sometimes boring, but actually quite interesting reports. We do that a lot. Uh, well, maybe I don't have as much out of our people that can do unbelievable breakthrough cognitive thinking. Yeah. People who can see the system and all its intricacies then create a vision. If you go through that report, what you'll find is that we call that out as a core strength. And that's the sort of thing that we need as an organization. Frankly, that's the sort of thing that we lack as an organization. So we went as far, Mervyn, as three years ago, we made some significant changes to our recruitment process to make sure that we were bringing into the organization people that had dyslexic strengths. And even so far, we can tell he's made a big difference. So you're looking at talent on a continuous basis? Mm. Yeah, indeed. And I think that um, one of the things that is both a, a challenge and a, a strength, actually, is you know, if, you, if you look at what a lot of firms are, are wanting, and we work at sort of board level in, in the top of most organizations, it's leadership and EQ. So you've got um, agile thinking, all of these wonderful sort of consultancy type words that you hear all the time. Um, if you look at someone who is 
uh, dyslexic, it's highly likely that they will have had to have depended, as indeed I have all my career, on EQ. Um, I have to observe, I have to watch, I have to interpret, I then have to try and uh, find my strategies for coping um, and make sure that I can overcome those issues. And actually, if you think about it, an awful lot of people with dyslexia do exactly the same thing. They are actually the qualities that we're looking for now for, for businesses. You know, it's have you got the EQ to spot the thing that someone else hasn't? There's a great guy that I've known for a, a while, a, a chap called um, Simon Gulliford. Simon is the most unbelievable marketing strategist I have ever yeah. come across. He looks at the world upside down. That's his, that's his version of how he describes it. And he has helped organizations that, that are numerous, very big, look at their customer proposition in a very, very different way because he just sees things differently. He's dyslexic, he's, he's proud of it, he, he uses it and um, works on it constantly. And I think as headhunters and as recruiters and provider of talent to business, we have to look at the whole skill set. That can sometimes get taken out by some assessments. So I think you know the growth of assessments should be for it should be agile thinking that we're looking for as opposed to the standard what is someone's literacy. You shouldn't be using that anymore. Well, if I may d d ask the question of all of you, I did not know I was dyslexic until I, until my thirties when I did what in those days it was more of a um, today we would call it psychometric test uh, at Harvard and did the psychometric test and they said. We need, you, you need to come back for a, a session, uh, you need to do it again. Something went wrong with the test. I did it again, and then suddenly I find I'm in the room with three people who are saying, you know, part of the test, it was outstanding. The other part, uh, there's something wrong with you. And I think that it was then suddenly an awakening. I think that there's a real flaw in the graduate intake system today, mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of multinationals and, and corporates, because it's all based on a psychometric test that I don't believe uh, is suitable for a lot of dyslexics. Comment. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think we're still on a journey in, in this area. Uh, I mentioned the changes we made three years ago. So uh, now, if you want to apply to EY, and I hope all of you do in a way, we recruit over 1,200 young people every year and 2,500 altogether. So we're desperately short of talent, so if any of you want to apply, uh, go look at the website. It's an easy thing to do. But the changes we made, including taking away uh, disclosure of your academic qualifications. Yeah. Now, why would we do that? Well, actually, we're looking for a set of skills that are not defined by your academic qualifications. Mm. I'll go back to the scarce skills we want are people that can create vision, look at a complex uh, problem, see the breakthrough idea. And as uh, Matt said on stage with where AI is going and robotics in a moment, the skills that are more commonplace are actually going to be replaced by the fourth industrial revolution. Yeah. So we've been working really hard, but it's still a journey, still much for us to do, to try and work out how do we get hold of the special people that really make an organization extraordinary. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. And we, we can be very traditional in big organizations, especially civil service. GCHQ was lucky because we'd always valued those people who, in your terms, were sort of failing in that area. We thought them as actually part of the, yeah. the real core. But um, the, the, the system in general favors you know, process-based, text-based selection. Uh, and that obviously just doesn't work for dyslexics. Um, I, I'm now in the private sector doing a run up a cybersecurity company called Blue Voyant, and all of us in cyber are str struggling with talent skills. Mm. We really don't care whether people can spell or <laughs> what academic qualifications they have. Uh, it's the ability to, to solve problems, to have emotional intelligence, uh, to do leadership. They're, they're things that really traditional processes are not testing. So we have to we have to throw some of that out, I think. And I felt guilty listening to Matt, actually, because for 20 years I was a civil servant producing many of those long text documents <laughs> yeah. and sticking yeah. them in red boxes. And actually, the person who's here, I think I saw Andy Pike earlier, he's now at number 10, but he recruited him as director of communications in GCHQ, really to kind of bring GCHQ out of the shadows uh, and did a lot of that, uh, 
the stuff you may have seen around puzzles and uh, bringing, bring, humanizing the organization, if you like. Um, who's a dyslexic, um, a dyslexic director of communications. Um, you know, the whole system is based around communications people who can absorb huge amounts of text uh, and very quickly respond to it. And he said to me, I think on day one, there's no point firing me all this stuff, you know, half an hour before the meeting. Put it slightly more bluntly than that, actually. But um, he, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a really good challenge. And as Matt says, it leads to better results because it puts a discipline on people to actually say what needs to be said rather than swamping them with text. Uh, but actually, you get what you get is an amazing sort of strategic mm -hmm. mind and a creativity and innovation that you cannot get from process-based thought. Could I just move to the audience? And we've got Ben and Georgia. Uh, where are you? Are you, 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 you may, I'm hoping you haven't disappeared. Uh, two 16-year-olds, uh, they are pre-warned, so we're not dropping them in it. But um, I, I think the question for you, and hopefully there's a microphone on its way to you. You've got it. OK. Um, two 16-year-olds who are going through the challenges uh, of schooling and exams, uh, just talk us through just the highlights of some of the challenges you both have. Maybe start with Georgia. You've got the microphone. Uh, and, yeah. and give them both a round of applause in advance. Um, I felt like some of the challenges at school, especially during GCSE, was probably my organization skills and managing to lose every single thing that I could get my hands on. And also, um, you know, just being classed as a teacher, it's not understanding, it's sort of like lazy and not bothering to sort myself out when in fact I was trying <laughs> quite hard, but it wasn't really paying off in the way that I would want it to. And also just a general, um, just writing essays under these pressurizing like time conditions and the grammar, just thinking like, uh, again, like I'm lazy, I can't be bothered to spell, check all my work when really I, I see it as the correct thing when it's, when it's not. Thank you. Ben? Uh, the challenges I faced mainly were uh, during the classroom keeping up. So things like the whiteboard, sometimes I wouldn't get everything down and I would, that would then collateral damage in the future. I wouldn't have all the notes and then I wouldn't be prepared. So yeah. So, so I'll come back to you in a sec, but I suppose the question for the starting with you, Steve, is, is how can we help kids today and the new generation? What can big corporates, institutions, what can we do? Is it through media pressure? What is it? What, what can we do to, to, to make it easier, the journey? Sure, if you um, look at the report, there are three recommendations that we make. Um, two of those I, I could sum up as um, move to a strengths-based culture. So uh, the phrase I used with Mervyn earlier on is you don't recruit superwoman and then, and then tell her every day she's no good with kryptonite. <laughs> That's not the thing to do. You praise someone for the strengths they have and you admire them because you recruited them to be part of a team for which their differences made that team excel. So I think first part of it, as the, as the report says, is let's talk about the strengths that people have. And then the second is having more events like this. Uh, and maybe next time we have an event like this, what we can also do is invite our colleagues that are not dyslexic so they can go on the journey with us. The ability to create a language yeah. that uh, enables us all to talk about the strengths of dyslexics, I think getting that out into the open, I think Matt's movement has been a, a watershed mm. for the way that mm. many people think about dyslexia a member of the cabinet, two members of the cabinet. So I think wrapping together both of those, those ideas, one is move into a strength-based culture where you talk up what people are able to do, not point out the flaws they have, and then also creating a, an environment, a broader environment, where we have the language and inclusive with our other colleagues so we can all work together on this agenda. Those would be two ideas. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, it's really important to understand, you know, when, when you're interviewing people, you say, what are your strengths and weaknesses? That's a, an age-old question. Um, I think it's really important to understand what other people see as your weakness and be able to say, I want to join a company that is going to celebrate that I can do X, Y, and Z. 
Um, I think that, you know, ac actually Microsoft, and I, I didn't intend this to be a plug because I wasn't supposed to be here. Um, Microsoft is really interesting as an organization. It pulls teams together based on, they think that most people are really good at three things. And therefore, if there are six key activities for any task, they pull together one person that's good at three and the other person that's good at the other three. And I think that, as a, as a culture, uh, is, is about making sure that the team is successful and that everyone that's contributing to it knows that they're really focusing on their top three things. So my advice to you two, in particular, would be just make sure that you're really open and strong when it comes to someone asking you what you do well and what actually do you need more help with. Never see it as a negative. And I think the more any of us that are in the job of employing people, absolutely to your point, Steve, focus on strengths, focus on what you need to build a team, and really focus on the future contribution. We should stop looking at the past sort of academic qualifications, yeah. particularly for 50-year-old women like me, where actually I didn't get diagnosed, I wasn't identified as being dyslexic. Uh, a lot of people would say that know me that I blagged it to hear. Yeah, I did, because that's what I had to do. There wasn't the support mechanism. So let's look at also embracing people my age that could re-enter the workplace with a different perspective. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with, with, with that. Um, all I'd say is that I think, it, I think technology is moving in the right direction here mm. because when, mm. when we were sort of your age, I guess, it was all text-based and linear. <laughs> now, actually, it's about numbers and pictures. So my kids are learning as much through videos. Their natural instinct is now to look for an image not for a bit of text. They don't even go to Wikipedia, they go to YouTube to find out about something. I guess it may be the same for you, be interested to know. So pictures are, are really important now. Um, and yet text is being replaced by those, those digital numbers. So it, everything is becoming intuitive in ways that I think really favor people who are neurodiverse. I don't know anybody now of, of, sort of teenage years who looks at an instruction manual for a new piece of equipment now. You just do it intuitively and you don't get an instruction. When I was there, you had to read the instruction manual to, in a linear way and then, <laughs> if you could, and then you would try and operate it. That, that's, that's, life has changed. So I think technology is pushing us in that direction and as Matt says, the, the future is there. So the, the skills we are going to need to work that technology uh, are going to be the ones that play to the strengths of people who are neurodiverse. Questions from the audience? Yeah. So I'm sitting here thinking about two major issues. One is colleges of education, and they don't get what you're talking about. It's not happening. The other is, is how do we monetize this in a way that people in your roles that don't have dyslexic experiences can speak to those that are teaching our kids about the need for this. Because unless the colleges of education, and I'm from the States, right, see what you see the way many of us in this audience see it, they're going to keep brutalizing our children, right? So you are in positions of power, and money is important, so can we merge the two and wake up those that need to teach our kids? Right. Um, I, yep. I totally agree. I think we should. And, and in fact, I met... Sorry, I'm going to point you out. Um, I met somebody on the way in here who is a uh, professor at Imperial who is dyslexic and fight, f you know, fights that cause every day in terms of getting a, a better understanding and a better um, opportunity. Uh, I, I think the movement, as, as I think we've seen this evening... It's, it's now. We need to move forward from here and, and actually start um, talking about this more. I, for one, am going to talk about this every day for the next God knows how many years, because I've never said it publicly before, and I'm delighted that I have, however, impromptu you tonight, and I will make it part of my mentor going forward. If I think it's a combination. I'll pass on Steve. I think, uh, I, I think having somebody like Matt in power in government is incredibly powerful. But we do, we do need the corporate sector to speak up. We really do. And uh, I've done a stint in both. And, and I think that the work that's gone in, the sponsorship from Microsoft, the work that's gone in with EY is very powerful. But everybody in the room, everybody has to become an ambassador and force change because otherwise it's too slow. Steve. I would add two things to it. Um, so 
organizations like mine, we tend to have a big impact on campus. I mentioned earlier on, we recruit about 900 undergraduates a year. Uh, my commitment is that we'll take this story to campus. So that when we go to campus, we talk not just to the young people there, but also to the academics. We stress our approach to recruiting on strengths-based, which includes a, a real need for people to have uh, dyslexic traits. And that's a strength to bring to our organization. Uh, and we'll ask our, the others, they're in the big four, the big six, all the big professional services firms, mm -hmm. to join us in that. So that, that could be part of the movement that we're all part of that started tonight. Yep. Now, all I'd add is that I think on your really great challenge of how do we monetize this, how do we, how do we you know, make a value in doing it, I think the tech sector is beginning to do this. There's such a shortage. In my sector, there's a massive shortage of skills. And I think people are actively looking around for ways of recruiting and developing people on aptitude, on non-traditional ways. We did that in GCHQ, but I mean, outside government, it's happening. It will take a while, and I agree that it's, it's tough for the education sector to, to keep up. Uh, it, it, it's totally wrong, and I think the more we challenge organisations on this, the better, because we, we don't need uniform sort of vanilla uh, talent in business. What we need is agile thinking and... And a good mix. You know, you need you need some people that are great at process. I always surround myself with fantastic process people, and that's what you need. You need a mix and a combination. Yeah, I completely agree. It does need leaders, I think, to reach down into yeah. their HR processes and departments and actually take some risks and empower other people to take some risks. Because it, yeah. it does mean doing some unconventional things, and, and individuals have to lead that, I think. Yeah. And in the way you frame that with they're looking for the average, I say you look for the average, you get the average. Yeah. Our job, Great. our job is to mm. get the extraordinary. That's what we're trying to build a firm on. Good point. I think if there are um, any uh, human resources, personnel, people, directors watching this, we've got one message for you. Wake up to the fact that the companies that you're working for need different type of thinkers in the day and age that we're in. And that's why you need dyslexic in your work, uh, dyslexics in your workforce. And you need to wake up to the fact that the system of recruitment in a lot of companies is not right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. end of panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.